Okay, um, um, Mary Meller is um, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of Northumbria, and she's going to cover the implication of this system for sustainability. Um, take it away. I have one word for Michael. I ha I'm, I'm surprised that he thinks that academic economics is pluralistic. I, and that, I mean, that is the problem. We have not, these views have not been able to be spoken within the academic context for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, this, I haven't got very much time, um, but if anybody's interested in what I do say, I've got a, le a full lecture on YouTube called Bringing Economics Down to Earth which meets some of Michael's points as well. Um, and uh, so sort of an expanded view of this. I've been asked to talk about the, um, uh, the ecological implications of the current uh, financial and banking system. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Lots of good ideas around in the green area. Lots of debates, of course, which I'm not going to go into. But you've got the Green New Deal idea. You've got uh, the idea of green investment. You've got the idea of green banking. So the question is, can the present system respond? And I think the straight answer, I mean, could it respond with what's the popular theory at the moment? A nudge. Would a little nudge help it all go in the right direction? Would it start to meet the triple bottom line? Would it look after the, could it, could it bring together economic viability with social justice, with ecological sustainability? The answer is no. Um, firstly, because the market price excludes a lot of the social and environmental costs anyway. Secondly, because it's profit driven, it goes for the, the, the best deal in money terms. Uh, because it's also built on, on the concept of credit worthiness, as who can have all this money we've been talk, talked about who's coming out. And it also depends on effective demand, that is who's got money to, uh, to spend or to invest. And, that, and all that is based on current existing patterns of valuing. And, and that is what we're trying to get away from. So the current system, it seems to me, cannot, cannot evolve. Um, so and we know this because green campaigners look to governments. They look to the public. They look to the NGOs. They look to social movements. They don't look to the banking system. And uh, just recently, there's an LSE report on low carbon growth, calls on the government to take the lead, um, uh, go to the other, uh, another part of the world, uh, the U UN East Asia programme, uh, together with the uh, Asian Development Bank, has uh, talking about green growth, green resilience, but admits that there is a problem with time gap with the current financial system. And that is, for anything that's going to be ecologically um, sound, it's going to be a high initial input uh, in terms of uh, capital investment and it's going to be a long-term slow bring back of returns and uh, uh, and our system works entirely the opposite it's been going for the quickest cheapest form of credit and leveraged investment it can possibly get with the fastest turnaround sometimes seconds when you're when you're in the casino world um, it doesn't want to wait three four five years for your solar panels to pay you back um, so uh, so the, the current system just cannot be sustainable ecologically. What you need uh, for, to be sustainable ecologically is slow, patient capital. That's what you need. Specialist banks, specialist uh, equipment. So I don't think green growth or sustainable development is, is a possibility anyway. And uh, uh, what we need is degrowth, in fact, um, uh, coming down to sufficiency, contract and convergence. We need to talk about levelling down. That was what they always did to laugh at all the old socialists. Oh, you're all talking about levelling down. Yes, we do have to level down. We have to level down in our consumption. So what we need to look for is not um, maximisation, but sufficiency. Enough. How much is enough? And these are the questions we have to ask. And this must be about social justice, because enough for one must mean enough for all. You can't have just enough for somebody and, and too much for somebody else or not enough. It, uh, once you've got that notion of sufficiency, I think we, we're on the right path. Um, and the current system has no basis for sufficiency, no basis for uh, ultimate provisioning security, uh, because the one thing you cannot base your security on is money. If I asked you how much bread you needed to live on when you were 80 years old, and some of us are getting pretty close to it now. Um, how much bread do you need? You could tell me I, I would probably eat a loaf a week or half a loaf. If I asked you how much money you need to put aside to buy a loaf of bread when you're 80, you would never know. You would never know how much was enough. So if your society promises you enough bread when you're 80, you know what you've got. 
If, if your financial system, with all the, you know, put your annuities in, etc., you have no idea if your little pot of money is going to buy you bread when you're 80. Uh, so the, the um, and we know, in fact, that money is, money is not valued in it. So this is the illusion of gold, the illusion of that hard money notion that somehow there is real value in money. Money historically, as we've been being told, is a system of trust. It's a system of entitlements. It's a system of obligations. It's a, a system of recognition of, of our contribution to society and our entitlements, our claims. This is what money is. In itself, it's nothing. It's only as good as the society in which it sits. And so it's your society that gives you your security. It can never, never be money. So that's why uh, the word economy is not helpful. I think a better word is provisioning. We, how will we provision ourselves when we're 80? How will we provision ourselves now? And that is everything inside and outside. So let's go to the very few slides I've got um, uh, to show you some slides which I think are, uh, these go way back, 1999. But what it's pointing out is that, uh, <laughs> past history, um, the, how little the formal economy that hamstrings us all is. Look at it, right on the top of the iceberg there. This is meant to represent an iceberg. Capital and wage, uh, wage labour. Just very little, very little part of all of our lives. Underneath that is all the, um, uh, the invisible economy, the informal economy. Below that, there's the subsistence economy. Below that, there's domestic economy. Below that, there's all the, uh, the, uh, the ways that uh, our, our richer economies are sustained by the internal and external exploitation of people around the world and in your own, your own society. And then the biggest one of all, which we're talking about here, is, is nature. Or there's another one which is quite famous, which is Hazel Henderson's cake where she has uh, the market economy, the formal economy that we are being hamstrung by, as just the icing on a cake. And then she has under that uh, the public sector, then she has under that slightly different version, she has the cash-based informal economy, the off-the-books economy, and then she has all the social economies, the community, the household, and then she has nature. Um, I would put it another way that we have economic dualism. We have this concept of economic man who can be a woman, um, uh, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a universal notion, really, based on market value, personal wealth, able-bodied workers, labour and intellect, exploitable resources and tradable knowledge. This is what's inside this money economy we're talking about, this banking economy, this economy that's funded. And on the other side, we have women's work, subsistence, reciprocity, the sick, the needy and the old, the, the life of the body ecosystems, wild nature, feelings, emotions, wisdom, these are undervalued or not valued at all. And, uh, and this is what provisioning is. Provisioning is integrating all of this. And that's what's important to recognise, particularly this concept of economic man being an able-bodied person. It's a person in the prime of their life and in the prime of their day. The rest of their life cycle, the rest of their needs, the rest of their sustenance, the rest of their youth and their age, this, this, this formal system we're talking about doesn't want it. So how are we going to provision that? Uh, that that's, that that's, that's the major question. And, uh, and uh, the reason that we don't value this half, the other half, is because of what I call handbag economics. And this is what really we've been under. Uh, you re you'd recognise handbag economics. We, got to, we can't pay ourselves more than we earn. We've, got to, we've only got so much in the kitty. Uh, and, uh, but, of course, this story is being told us by the financial father figure, who is the wealth creator, to the public wife, wife figure, who's got her little handbag with her housekeeping allowance in it, and that's all she's allowed to have. Meanwhile, the, uh, uh, the, the, the wealth-earning father, financial father, is, is uh, pr uh, producing and circulating as much money as he can, gambling as much money as he can, at the same time keeping the public wife and very much under control. You can't spend more than you earn. Except, of course, when he gets into trouble. When he gets into trouble, he suddenly finds that the public wife can borrow and has to borrow more and more and more and more on his behalf. Unfortunately, she has to be punished for this. So the children are made to starve on the grounds that she is wasting her money, bailing him out. Have, I mean, this doesn't wreck this doesn't seem to be reality, does it? This, we don't live under that sort of handbag economics, do we? Um, 
But, uh, and in the end, of course, when it, it, even that fails, we suddenly find that the public wife also has a magic money machine and starts to use it. But then the father wealth creator says, let me have that, let me have that. Oh, you, uh, you don't know how to spend it. I can spend it. Give it to me, give it to me. And so the, the wife, the bullied wife, has to do that uh, until once more he's, he's, he's solvent again. And once he's solvent, he does what all abusive males in households do, goes back to status quo, and off we go again. And that's what we have lived under. We've lived under handbag economics. Um, and, and, and the question we have to ask, the, the big question we have to ask, is, a, is a, a question of democracy. By what right do these people issue money to who they issue it to? What is, the, what is the basis of their legitimacy? And the answer is that basically they have none, except they pretend that they really do create wealth. They pretend that, they really, that the money somehow pops out the world, doesn't it? it, it's a, it and, and it just happens to fall into their hands. How did that happen? Um, uh, it, it, it's, there, is no, there is no moral obligation. If I'm rich, it's because I must deserve it. So it's having the money that makes you justified. You're not justified, and then you get the money. So those who hold the money claim the moral high ground. And the poor public wife who sustains the whole thing. And we know the public wife sustains the whole thing because it's the public wife who had to bail it all out. We know the whole thing hangs together and there's no real private in the, in, in the financial father's world because when Lehman's went down, which was supposed to be a private bank, it nearly took everything else down with it. We know how interconnected it all is. Um, uh, so so we, know, we know that when Northern Rock went down, um, Adam Apple, Applegarth tried to quell everybody, didn't work. Um, uh, um, uh, Mer um, uh, uh, what's he called? Uh, King uh, tried to do it. Nobody listened. It's only when Alistair <coughs> Darning came out and put the public behind it that the, 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 the lines went away. We know with Ice Save, with, uh, which was not even a, a British bank, where did they go when that failed? Straight to the government. Give us our money back. The public know it's public money. Why would they get... The, if your car breaks down, you don't go to the government. You don't say, hey, look, my, my stupid Icelandic car's broken down. Sort it. You don't do that. But these stupid Icelandic banks went down, and you go, don't go to Iceland. No, shh. Straight to the public know it's public money. The public know it's a public resource. The public know only the public hold it up. And those public are, 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 are the investors as well. I mean, the investors in this case are the public. They're, they're, they're no, no, no separate. So uh, this debt-based money economy, as we had explained, there's never enough. There's no basis for sufficiency. So let's go back. In fact, it's so inefficient, you have a two-step instead of a one-step economy, don't you? You have to earn money to live. So what do you earn money at? Well, anything that will pay you well. So there's no democratic choice, really, about where you work with it. Uh, maybe for some be better educated, better off, but for most people, they work where they can to buy the goods and services they really need. That's a two-step economy. That's in, why not a one-step economy? Why, do, why can't people be doing the things they want to do for the things they actually need? So they're, they're working where they are. So let's... Uh, but I think the one thing that handbag economics does point us to <coughs> is, we're, to, it, it's, in a way, it's looking in the right place. It's looking to the women, because it's handbag economics. And there is a whole other field in the household that women know about. I don't know how many men know about them, but probably a lot of you do, because there is a whole economy that goes within the household that many women are involved in their life, and this is the babysitting circle. Many of you will have been in babysitting circles. Now, those of you who've been in babysitting circles will know that you could run it by just word of mouth. You could sort of uh, do some hours and phone up and say, oh, I've done five hours for Susie and, 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 and Jim, and then, you know, uh, then they'll come and do some for me. A bit like a let scheme, you know, where you kind of have to write it all down or record it all. That's quite difficult to run. Even a small babysitting circle, 10 people in a babysitting circle, what will they do? The first thing they'll do is they'll get bits of card, they'll cut it up, and they'll give each other 10 tokens. And, this is, and then they'll start trading. 
So it seems to me that women in babysitting circles and the men who join them as well, they know how an economy works and how a money system works. It's not to do with finding a little pot of gold. It's not do with doing a barter economy. And the reason that that whole the traditional economics thing is totally wrong is because there's no historical record of barter economies at all. There may be some bartering in economies, but the concept of a barter economy is, an, is a nonsense. So basically, what we have, the world is households. The world is people. The world is reciprocity. That is the real economy. Provisioning is the real economy. And this is what the, uh, the women's work side, and women's work can be done by men, it's not all done by women. The women's work world knows what an economy is, it knows what a money system is, it's babysitting tokens. It isn't handbags. And until we've got that in our head, we're never going to get a sustainable sufficiency economy. So, what's the secret? And um, what's the, the secret? Let's follow this, this babysitting token a little bit more. The point about the babysitting tokens is you didn't have to do anything for them to appear. That is, they are an issue into the economy, the economy of babysitting. By, uh, by agreement, somebody acts as kind of, uh, somebody sort of convenes it and cuts up the card. It's a system of trust. People, don't, people could easily counterfeit the, the, the cards, but they don't, the, the, the tokens, but they don't. Um, it's not even terribly important if you collect in the tokens from people who leave the babysitting circle because exactly how many tokens there are isn't the issue. The tokens are a convenient way of accounting. I have done three hours for you, okay, you give me three bits of card and that's, it, that's easy. So we understand that money is an accounting system, it's a system of trust, we don't duplicate it. it, the, it doesn't, the money doesn't matter, the point is you are a babysitting circle who help each other out and you have needs, which is for babysitting, and you, and, uh, you might have tons of the tokens, but somebody asks you to babysit, you don't say, no, I've got tons of tokens. No, you say, yes, you need to go out, I'll come and babysit for you, because it's a system of provisioning. That is, the, that is the starting point. It's not a, a position about money and then some. It's about doing what needs to be done and then accounting for it. And, uh, and, and that's what needs to be done. And the other thing about um, a money system, which uh, was being pointed out this morning, is at somewhere in the money system, you must have a, an issuer who does not reclaim all they issue. Because this is the problem with the debt-based system. It wants it all back and more. And where the more comes from is a, is a mute point. I mean, there are debates about whether it can be taken out of the system or not, and uh, that gets esoteric. But, but the point is that, um, that the, uh, you, in the end, you have to have money that is free of debt. The babysitting tokens are free of debt. Nobody is obliged for anything through being given 10 tokens. So... so you, the point about money is it must be free of debt at the point of issue. Now, you may decide to have revolving loan funds, you may be, decide to have different kinds of lending systems um, uh, afterwards, but the m substantial part of the money, in fact all the money that issued in society should be like babysitting tokens, it should be free at the point of issue and then based on a system of trust. And you say, right, okay, but what about the market? Has the market got uh, you know, something to offer? If you have what we're kind of suggesting here, which is that new money issue would be debt-free at the point of issue, uh, be spent into the economy. This is what the uh, reformers are arguing for. Spend the money into the economy so that, in a sense, you don't need the problem of taxation because you've, you've met your needs already. Um, and you say, oh, well, what happens? Wouldn't there be mismanagement? Well, do you still believe the efficient markets hypothesis after what we've been through? Do you think they are efficient and effective? Do you think they are not corrupt? Do you not think they are not wasteful? Do you not think they are not dangerous? And wouldn't the people, treating money as a people's resource, to be determined by the people collectively, would be a much better basis for a socially just and ecologically efficient economy? Thank you. Hi, I really like the babysitting token idea and being in a babysitting circle myself I'm aware what happens when there isn't enough babysitting tokens in the system yeah. it's really really hard to get other people to babysit for you or to offer to babysit for other people because people start hoarding their tokens so obviously I think that the amount of babysitting tokens in the system really matters yeah. Yeah. you need to have enough tokens that people um, 
are going out and doing that economic activity or the useful activity of babysitting. And but the good thing about babysitting tokens is you don't want to store them. They're not a store of value. So you don't just sit on them. You don't go, oh, I've got 20. I'm going to start taking it out of the system and sitting on it. So somebody has to keep issuing it. You only need to issue new tokens when more people come into, this, yeah. into the circle or if someone has lost them. Yeah. But it is a great analogy. Thank you. I think you've made the case against austerity there. <laughs> OK. Um, I have two questions. How would one create a climate of innovation in which there were multiple innovations that would take us toward a degrowth economy, an economy which offered high quality of life without the enormous destruction of the environment that we witness at the moment? The second question is, this process of moving toward centralized command and control economies which depend on hierarchy, which is embedded in the creation of endless useless work, has been going on for thousands of years. It is not a new thing. How is one to understand this network of social forces that push us inevitably in the direction of hierarchy and the creation of senseless work, which is destroying our habitat? Mm. Any, anybody else? Or shall I get Mary to answer those? Well, I think uh, uh, my answer would be that you've got to get people out of this two-step two economy where they have to work at what they don't want to work at. And I think we, historically we know that the, the idea of all money emerging in the trade system, which is the old gold and barter thing, m there may be some elements in that, but, but it's only a, a tiny bit of the story. The big history of money is money being uh, socially or politically constructed a uh, thing. And I think that surely we have the chance now, now that we are democratic societies and not top down um, uh, Alexander the Great sort of societies or the Roman society or whatever, um, the, the, the great hierarchical societies, do we not have the opportunity now to recognize the money system as a collective system which we uphold? It's a social and a political system. It's not an economic system, and don't we, could we use our democracy, which we have now, to trust ourselves, to issue the money to ourselves? Don't we trust people to want, don't need the money? Why, why do we assume people need the money motivation to be innovative, to be creative, um, to be resourceful? So surely this is the twisted logic of the society we live in. So it seems to me that we have an opportunity now, if we understand how money systems works, that they're, they're babysitting tokens, not handbags. If we can understand that, and if we can trust ourselves and collectively um, uh, debate among ourselves the best way to organize our society, which may have strong elements of private, uh, private innovation, um, there's no reason to exclude it altogether, but it needs to see itself as part of the mix and not the determinant factor. I think we, 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 need, we need some confidence in ourselves. And once we've got confidence in ourselves, then I think people will be able to build from the bottom up. And I don't think the money, if the money system does come publicly, I don't think it has to come in the top-down way. I think it could come in local investment banks, local development banks, specialist, uh, specialist um, uh, lending systems or grant awarding systems. Um, which, uh, which would enable uh, people to get con much more control of their local economy. So I think we have, a, uh, we have shown by the failure of this system that all money in the end is publicly underpinned. It's a public responsibility. Therefore, it should be a public resource. Therefore, it should be a public right. And I think once we understand that, then we can start to reclaim our wider economy for ourselves. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, OK. Um, by the way, I'm giving very short introductions, and that's because I spent all weekend making this program for you with nice long profiles on each um, speaker, so do um, consult with that if you feel I haven't given enough information. By the way, Mary's written a great book called The Future of Money, and unfortunately we don't have any copies here, but you can look for it online. I am so uncommercial that I don't... <laughs> I, I tell you, that's true. I, I, my partner's in the audience and says, you never tell people what you're doing, you never tell people... I, Great. Uh, okay, so I'm unworldly. <laughs> I'm not rewarded by money. <laughs> so um, next.